before people come in. So um, uh, welcome to uh, the second of uh, three talks uh, that I'll be delivering on our COVID-19 uh, modeling work um, as conducted for the province and for our central authorities uh, elsewhere in Canada and in some cases for uh, overseas clients as well. Um, this uh, second talk is rather different from the first. Um, uh, within the uh, first lecture from this floor, I uh, described about a week ago, um, the broader program of work, uh, its chronology, um, the elements at a technical level that uh, contributed to it, um, highlighted the heroic contributions of, uh, of quite a few in our graduate program, um, and noted some of the lessons learned and uh, principles um, uh, and, uh, and barriers that uh, we encountered within that work. Um, that was by design a, a very broad brush look at, um, at the past year's experience and uh, sought to, um, to abstract over the details of the different projects and convey some of the learnings. By contrast, today, uh, I'm planning um, to go on a deeper dive um, for, um, for one project. Um, and that is a project that's uh, geared towards uh, supporting always updated models that are designed to provide reporting on the current underlying situation, epidemiologic and healthcare-wise. Um, uh, and also supporting uh, shorter term projections and what if questions that can inform decision making in the, uh, the jurisdictions uh, studied. This is work that brings together dynamic models with rich data sources, um, some of the more traditional, some less traditional, such as wastewater data. In other contexts, we've leveraged things like social media data, search data, et cetera. Um, and we'll see how uh, the algorithms that we use bring together data sources on the one hand and dynamic models on the other. Data sources capturing latest <laughs> evidence, but recognizing that it's very fallible, um, has omissions, has biases and, and systematic errors. Um, and on the other side, models that capture, in some sense, the theory of the system. And these techniques bring them together. Um, and what are those techniques? Well, they're a set of, of Bayesian techniques um, that are sometimes called Bayesian filtering techniques, but the name can be misleading to those who are, who are not familiar with the, the lingo of that, that area. So there are machine learning or artificial intelligence techniques that mesh these two together. And they're techniques of some sophistication. Um, we look at two techniques as time allows today. Number one, particle filtering, uh, a sequential Monte Carlo approach. Number two, particle Markov chain Monte Carlo, um, which uh, incorporates particle filtering as, as a component of it, but allows us to also estimate static parameters um, that fall outside the purview of, of what we look at within um, particle filtering by itself. And we'll see how these two methods um, provide us a uh, efficient, performant, um, and uh, very, uh, very uh, computationally uh, um, capable method uh, that allows us to merge data sources from the world with, with, with understanding captured in theory to allow us to anticipate, to understand the current situation better, give us sort of a, a 3D view of what's going on right now and, and project forward in a way that's, um, that, that characterizes the natural momentum of the system, the, the sort of the, uh, how the system works in a mechanistic level. Um, but this is a story about more than the computational statistics, dynamic modeling and empirical data. Um, this is a story also uh, that is um, also speaks to our charter as computer scientists, where 
we, we not only study problems, but we build tools that help us take on those problems with greater alacrity and, and capability. Um, and uh, this is a story of a tremendous contribution on the computational infrastructure side that has made possible a world-class and I would argue world-leading uh, infrastructural platform to support this sort of work. So that day in, day out, the sort of intelligence that can be secured through these, through these machine learning, AI algorithms, combining data and dynamic models, theory-based dynamic models, um, can be regularized, can be uh, turned into to regular reporting um, uh, and, and rendered into regular updates as far as to what might be expected over the next two weeks, can bring in additional sources of data uh, can support crisp characterization of the needs of new, new clients um, in a way that doesn't involve reinventing the wheel or, or doing a tremendous amount of additional work that's highly modular. Um, in many ways, this is a, a story also of, of good software engineering, um, of good multi-tiered design um, uh, that we'll get a glimpse of as amongst us as computer scientists. Um, uh, but finally, in perhaps most um, uh, in, in most laudatory of fashion, this is a story of heroism, and it's a story of heroism by heroes amongst us. Um, uh, several, uh, my student uh, Li Xiaoyan, uh, Lu Jie Duan, uh, who, who contributed in huge ways to this, and in a more more recent basis, uh, people such as Eric Redekop, uh, Aaron Todorash. Um, and uh, Vyam Patel, who have uh, contributed in, in running this system um, in a way that, that affords a broad dissemination of the, the intelligence generated each day. Um, and, and their heroism um, reflects not merely um, um, great, great hours devoted to the cause, though they were there, but also great sacrifice to um, to personal uh, goals and, and um, other opportunities, great opportunity cost, um, taking people away from, from doctoral dissertations or, or, or from graduation. And, and for this, I'm, I'm profoundly grateful. Um, but it also was an amazing intellectual contribution that they've made, often in the wee, or, uh, wee hours of the morning um, jointly, sometimes with me, sometimes in lonely sessions by themselves, by which they have built up uh, what is probably the most sophisticated infrastructure of its world, of, in the world of this sort. Um, and I'm going to try to feature that in this talk. Um, as time allows, we may also learn a little bit uh, more about, about some of the more advanced methods of particle MCMC currently being uh, um, being, being led by Jeremy Ung, but with so much put into place by uh, Stiao Yan and, and by Lu Jie, um, and with, with so much uh, patient um, guidance by uh, Zhu Xin Liu and Math and Stats. We may also see um, a little bit about the texture of the wastewater data that is an increasingly valuable component of this, of this potent mix of multiple lines of evidence with models that allows us to kind of triangulate what's going on in the world at any one time. Um, and uh, those are some of the sort of smaller vignettes woven in here as time allows. I'm grateful to uh, the organizers of this symposium for setting aside a, a two hour block for this so that we can be sure to, to field questions. Um, but like last time, I, I suspect I'll, you know, I'll take a good, good part of, of that time between uh, maybe an hour and 15 minutes if, if I uh, shoot properly um, for this talk alone, possibly as long as an hour and a half. Um, and uh, that's designed to, to more fully explicate some of these, um, these uh, features of the situation of which I've just spoken. Um, so w without further ado, I, I think I'll switch over to my slides. Um, and we'll get going. Um, so uh, within this uh, talk, I'm going to be talking about this real-time 
um, reporting on epidemiology and acute care needs, things like, you know, how many people are are likely to uh, to need hospitalization tomorrow, um, and and the ways in which this leverages uh, these sequential Monte Carlo and particle MCMC leverage transmission models in this uh, infrastructure. Um, so a little bit about context. I, I spoke from this floor a week ago about the origins of our work. Um, and um, the, the, the focus today is, is, is much more um, streamlined, uh, but I will note that it fits into that broader context. Um, I had, um, woven in some description of this narrative, but the race between, you know, the spread of infection from China uh, with um, the need to get work going. And uh, this work was kicked off in its envisioning um, in uh, the opening days of February at a concrete level, um, getting the particle filtering going. I knew based on what I had seen about the emerging epidemiology of COVID-19 that we needed agent-based models to, to confront it, and maybe hybrid models and particle filtering. And in the first meeting of our working group um, with uh, luminaries who later became heroes, many of them, and other contributors as well um, from within our group, uh, we, you know, we, we put a, a premium on, on those two lines of, of work. Um, that was while I was still in, in Boston, um, although roughly two weeks from, from this date where I shared a photo last time and noted that's the day which I had first been alerted to it. I started thinking about those lines of work then, but by February 1st, 4th, it was clear we needed them. And the work began towards this uh, really in earnest in March. Um, we'll be hearing similar chronology um, in my next talk on the agent-based model. Okay. Um, this work took place in the context of our advanced analytics uh, um, program. Um, and uh, I'd spoken about this before, but it saw me on secondment from March 2020 to the end of March 2021, um, with me being in an advisory capacity right now and, and with work going on led by Kurt Kruger on a contract basis. Um, and, uh, you know, during this time, we were embedded within the health system in a way that still leads us to um, secure data and, and, and provide us daily reporting uh, to our provincial authorities um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And in fact, since the formal um, conclusion of my, of my succumbent and, and formal relationships there, it's involved... Um, some expansions of that to include, for example, wastewater data and Saskatoon specific modeling. But this work also fits into the broader rubric of um, multiple partnerships of which I spoke last time. So, um, you know, it originated with a reporting in Saskatchewan and was expanded over time to reporting to Public Health Agency of Canada for reporting on each of the provinces of Canada um, and to uh, FNIB. Um, uh, the branch of Health Canada are responsible for First Nations and Inuit health. Um, we also um, have a, a very um, positive um, and expanding relationship with, with uh, Alberta Health Services in the form of Alex Doroshenko, who's uh, for many months now has been uh, exploring the use of these techniques within an Alberta context uh, with some learning on, on both sides. Um, so within this work, I've, I've mentioned some of the heroes, and I'm going to come back to their appropriately haloed faces towards the end of the talk. But um, just to put names with, with uh, faces, there's Shaoyan here over on the left, who somehow managed to juggle this together with uh, a family and, and category theory um, and advance, advancements and on, on that front, doing dynamic modeling in, in a categorical fashion. Um, there's uh, Lu Jie Duan, um, who also put in massive numbers of hours and amazing acuity um, in building up uh, the infrastructural system. Um, uh, this was a system to which Jason Gerritsen also originally contributed, and then Jeremy Young on the PMCMC side, together with a, a set of uh, undergraduates who have 
you know, delivered uh, far beyond uh, expectations since September um, and with uh, a new crop coming on right now. So um, motivations for this work, enough of context, but, but motivations. Um, uh, my impetus, uh, my initial impulse is to show, um, uh, show uh, actual data from our health system, but I'm bound by confidentiality agreements um, to, um, to limit what I can show publicly uh, without permission. And so I've, um, uh, I thought it would uh, suffice uh, or at least satisfice to, um, to show data from New York City from the first wave, um, a wave from which some of my, uh, in my social network have suffered grievously. And, uh, you know, in this case, what we see is kind of a cacophony of different time series of the sort that our decision makers, um, uh, whether in the high rises in New York or whether in Regina uh, or here in Saskatoon are, are asked to confront daily. Um, we see um, some reporting in Brown on the number of cases. Uh, we see uh, reports uh, associated with yellow on the number, the hospital census on a daily basis in, in New York, uh, rising uh, rapidly in almost an exponential way uh, early on. Um, we see ICU records. Um, we also see case positivity and a record of a growing number of tests. And, you know, for a decision maker, um, this at once provides a lot of information and very little information. Um, uh, when it when it comes to to data, there's a lot there. When it comes to insight and, and knowledge and, and understanding what this really means to move forward with decision making, there's a lot to be desired. Um, there's very natural questions that get get brought to the table, right? You know, um, okay, so we'd see these cases in Brown, um, and yet we see. Uh, rapid rises in the number of tests early on, paralleling this rapid rise in Brown for the number of cases. To what degree are, are those cases, uh, the rise in them, not a reflection of a, of a massive spread, but of just being better and better at detecting people, right? Um, and here we see, you know, the, um, the number in ICU and the number in, in hospital. But if we were to think about admissions there, um, uh, is that telling us we're missing a lot of people for our cases that, you know, they're finding us instead of in coming to the hospital instead of us finding them proactively? How many people are we missing in our contact tracing or, or our messaging efforts to bring people in? Um, and what all of these things are grappling with is, is, you know, the underlying system that gives rise to this. These are different faces. These are different facets. Um, of, of some underlying system. And these each whisper something about that system, but to really interpret them, um, to, to interpret what's going on underneath, you need to make sense of how these relate to one another. For example, how testing, how testing more and more might drive reporting of more cases um, and how test positivity might relate to the spread of infection and how these rising hospitalizations might relate to missed cases missed earlier. And going through that in our head is, is um, a fool's errand. Um, many studies have shown that when it comes to grappling with complex systems, such as spread of infectious diseases, even the most quantitative amongst us, the Einsteins that walk upon the world are quite hopeless and, and man at a practical level managing uh, complexity. Um, these are things that are wetware, for all its strengths in, in areas like visual recognition is just not set up to grapple with um, efficiently, but which computers at which computers can excel. Um, so we're dealing here with these interconnected, these intertwined um, uh, whisperings about an underlying situation. And much of today's talk is gonna be about how to use computational methods plus emerging evidence to probe what's going on beneath the covers, what's going on under there. Not taking you know, case data on its own account as the ground truth, but rather saying what's giving rise to this and how much of it is from testing and you know, um, from, from going out and beating the bushes to find people and 
And what is it telling us about whether we're finding them early or versus later, if we look at that compared with hospitalization records, uh, et cetera? Um, so, you know, at a, at a very high level, what I'm, what I'm talking about here is um, turning models into services um, that can help us on a day-to-day -day basis um, make sense of this emerging evidence, but make sense of it in light of, of grounded theory that comes from the literature, that comes from good empirical data about how COVID-19 works and how many people are have, have very few symptoms or oligo or pouty or, or asymptomatic, um, the stages it goes through. So this is about using models, machine learning, emerging evidence to kind of tell a, a compelling and hopefully quite accurate story about what's giving rise to all these different patterns, to these different faces that are thrust upon us in each day's new, new set of case counts and, and test volumes and hospitalizations. Um, so we're seeking to, to leverage the power of models, AI, and, and, and data to allow us to get a better understanding of what's going on now, those key values like the effective reproductive number you've heard about or force of infection, the chance a given person going out there and circulating will get infected you know, on a given day, for example. Um, what is it telling us about changes in behavior right now and the number of undiagnosed infectives? Um, at the same time, it, 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 we're laying the groundwork for giving a good understanding of the current situation to project forward and evaluate what if questions. Um, much of the motivation for this as a modeler concerns the fact that um, uh, I think it's incumbent upon us as modelers to be humble. Uh, it's important upon us as modelers to be skeptical of our own creations. Models are approximations of necessity. That's what gives them their value, um, just like a map. You know, um, you can never fit a map into the memory of your smartphone or into your, your in the front seat of your car uh, if it had every detail about the world. It's precisely because it's an approximation and an artful approximation, a, a judicious approximation that it offers value for particular tasks by abstracting the necessary information. And models are just like that. We purpose build them for a task and we do so um, in a way that leaves out tremendous amount of detail that you know, is, seems nth order, second order, third order for that task. And one of the things that this means, it's not the only reason, but it, it has it, one implication that it has is that look, even the most detailed models eventually diverge from empirical situation. There were no shortage of people who when we started working with our health system here in the province, we're suspicious of modeling. Um, and that took many months to overcome. But a more tricky issue than that was the fact that uh, perhaps an equally large group of people loved the idea of modeling, sought it, um, were, were just dying for models, but for the wrong reasons. They thought models could serve as these kind of crystal balls that would tell us what is going to happen over the next three months. And uh, the, the reflection here is, look, even the best of models is gonna diverge. It may have the best evidence of the time you build it. It may have the you know, really savvy approximations, but they are approximations. And it's not gonna be able to, to consider at the least, even if it's, you know, has just amazingly uh, savvy characterization of underlying processes it's never going to be able to characterize the, the stochastics of the system. You know, uh, a chance comment by the US president about ingesting bleach or, um, or you know, the occurrence of someone who just happened to go to the snowmobile rally and serve food when they had already gotten COVID-19 um, or that chance person who came back to the uh, bond spiel with COVID-19 and infected a whole bunch of doctors who then you know, brought it back to, uh, to uh, the, the care system. Um, uh, there were, um, you know, there's a set of exogenous changes, factors outside our control, outside the province, outside the country that we're never going to be able to anticipate. Um, uh, and even things like variant mutation, for example, you know, 
you can you can understand the rates uh, roughly, but you're not going to be able to say, oh, this really nasty triple or quadruple variant is going to sweep in and um, and change the game. Um, so there's a whole bunch of reasons that models, even the best of models, are going to diverge. Uh, the the idea of shooting for point prediction going in months forward is um, is 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 a fool's errand. It's just not something that's uh, in the nature of things to to create. Um, and and yet, uh, if we build our models as best we can and use them, we need as modelers to be consciously aware that they are going to diverge, and that that divergence from what we see in the world is not. It's maybe it's excusable, but it's not without its cost, because that divergence can really strongly limit the effectiveness of our models in understanding, for example, intervention trade-offs, or of anticipating at a rough level what we might expect in coming months, uh, or of evaluating you know, the, the value of bringing additional data to the table, any number of different goals. It's not that this divergence of models from what's observed in the world is, is uh, without its implications. Although it's excusable, it has very serious implications. If our models have a growing inconsistency you know, to, to what's going on in the world, there needs to be some way to bring them back in accordance with what's going on in the world if we want to get really grounded, um, uh, evidence-informed evidence understanding out of trade-offs between undertaking you know, um, outbreak response immunization efforts versus door-to-door -door screening in a, in a northern community. Um, so in this, in this sphere, um, you know, we're, we're seeking to update our models to stay in accordance with what's observed in the world. And part of the problem is that adjusting parameters for the model is not enough. We need to, to bring the model's understanding of what's going on right now back into alignment um, so that it isn't increasingly at odds with what's going on in the world. It's not merely a matter of tuning its parameters, but bringing the kind of the, the current situation from which we look forward into alignment. Um, so, so the hope underlying this work, as in so much of our other works along these lines, is you know to, to get out of the gate with models uh, that incorporate evidence over time. And, and to keep those models humble by bringing evidence to bear on them. The model represents a posited underlying situation. In fact, in the models we're gonna be building and what we'll be talking about here, we have hundreds of thousands of competing hypotheses about what's going on out there in the world at any one time. And the evidence kind of sifts through, the, through those and there's a, a survival of the fittest, those that explain the the evidence most effectively or most consistent with that evidence thrive and and seem like the most salient explanations and are better represented going forward. Those that might be reasonable ideas but are at variance with the evidence eventually die out um, in, in a process known as resampling. And the model state is kept current with this evidence um, and we can use it to project forward. So it's a bit like a weather model, um, uh, you know. So with weather models, um, we uh, particularly hear us in Saskatchewan um, are well aware of their limitations, um, and you know here we are on uh, the eleventh, I think, of of of, of May. Um, ooh. Uh, I'm trusting you folks can still see my screen okay. Is that right? Can anyone confirm uh, you could still hear me okay? I can. Uh, I can. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. One person develops great confidence. I got a, a, a notice about a disconnection for, for a network here. Um, so with a weather model, um, uh, there's uh, you know very good weather models that can be uh, highly highly sophisticated these years in the cells that they depict geographically, 
and the, the dynamics of weather flow. Um, but these weather models to, to carry water, to predict you know, tomorrow's weather, Friday's weather um, for the 12th of May, um, uh, we would never think about using um, a weather model that was last updated as of the end of April. Um, that'd be crazy. I mean, there's, there's so much which has occurred since then um, that we have a much better understanding about, about what's gonna go on tomorrow than even the best water, weather model would have had at the end of, of April. That same weather model, if it's been regrounded with data since the end of April till you know, uh, within the past hour, it's gonna have a much better estimate for what's gonna play out tomorrow than would a weather model of at the end of April. Um, there's just so many uncertainties that have gotten, you know, gotten resolved. Um, and so it is with these models. These are like weather models. We're constantly updating them with data. And it's not because the model is faulty so much as um, uh, there's, you know, so much more that we know about this situation. These are models that incorporate new evidence on an ongoing basis and use it to give um, better grounded expectations about what's going on um, down the road. So that's a bit of context and motivation. Um, let's talk about the techniques that, that we use to address this. And I, and I, I need to emphasize up front because I've seen confusions about this, that although these techniques involve matching data to model expectations, they are not curve fitting techniques. We are not, you know, just, kind of drawing a line between the points, um, connect the dots and, and saying that's gonna continue. No, 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 these are models about the underlying situation, the, the logic um, of, the, of the underlying situation, sometimes the heinous logic, the momentum of that underlying situation about how COVID-19 works. They seek to identify this kind of coherent, consistent understanding of what probably is going on in the external world in light of all these different lines of evidence. Things like cases to be sure, um, but also things like hospital admissions and ICU admissions, which might clue us into people being missed in, in a lot of the case finding. Um, people who, who weren't found early and therefore they come to us because they're terribly sick and we've missed an opportunity to to give them an early dose of dethamexazone and, 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 and protect them hopefully from progression. Uh, hospital census um, and deaths or other types of, of data used and where it's available, wastewater um, can be really, really useful. And the basic thing we're gonna be going through, it's gonna be a lot of words, some formulas, et cetera, but basically we're gonna infer um, uh, based on the data we see in ways that square with our understanding of the natural history and epidemiology of the situation, things captured in the dynamic model, we're going to infer, okay, what is going on at that lower level? How many people out there maybe are undiagnosed infectives? How many people out there are getting newly infected? Recognizing that that's a different question than how many get found as cases. Um, in many age groups, number of people without overt symptoms is, is the majority. Um, and uh, in our model, we're, we're reasoning about those quantities. Um, because these models infer the underlying situation in this way, consistent with theory, um, they then give us this tool for projecting forward and asking what if questions. Um, indeed, that's some of the purposes for which these models have been used um, with daily forward runs being used um, for some clients. So, you know, big picture here where these models are making use of a swath of different data, some more traditional from the health system, some more, um, <coughs> some more novel like wastewater. Um, we're hoping to layer in social media, which has made such a big impact in other areas of modeling and showing how we could further increase the accuracy of our of our predictions of flu trends using social media combined with exactly these techniques. So we're bringing in these, these types of data to estimate the current situation, what's going on right now, and all these things we can't observe, these latent quantities, and where's asking where's this going, with interventions or without. 
Okay, now, um, that being said, that's kind of a big picture. There's, there's really three techniques that I've explored with this. Um, uh, in many cases, together with uh, my close colleague, Jushin Liu, um, uh, who, who has had to tutor me on, on um, some of these for quite some time and, and a wonderful collaboration. Um, so uh, some of our first work was around MCMC. Um, here, we're really estimating the parameters of the model. Um, you know, the, the, the rate at which uh, people, static parameter representing um, the rate at which a, an infected person, once they reach a certain stage of the infection, needs to be, it develops complications requiring hospitalization or the risk of death for those who are in the ICU, um, uh, you know, before they, uh, before they recover. These are our static parameters that we might estimate, unknown constants. And MCMC allows us to, to estimate joint distributions for those. Um, now, particle filtering, the techniques that form the bulk of our of our day-to-day -day focus and the focus of this presentation, estimate something different. Um, given assumptions about those parameter values, um, those fixed parameter values in a given model, here we're estimating the underlying state of the model, this x1 to t indicating its state over time. Um, and in light of the evidence from the earliest time till now, that's, it's allowing us to estimate the underlying situation of the model. And um, here we are, we're dealing with a stochastic model and we're using this evidence as each new bit comes ev uh, of evidence comes out, we recursively update our estimate of, of, of this. And it's a joint distribution over the underlying state. And we'll see more in concrete terms what that means with, um, with our model. Finally, um, there's a technique, if time allows, I'll, I'll present on later this talk, which is uh, particle MCMC. And uh, this technique is, um, is designed to allow us to jointly estimate uh, both uh, the parameters and the, um, uh, and the underlying uh, state of, of the model. Um, now, these are approaches we've applied in many other contexts, many of them published, uh, and many involving some of the same heroes that are with us today. Um, but um, it's, it's uh, found uh, a lot of uh, interest and some use worldwide by the most methodologically advanced teams in modeling um, as the way of kind of estimating aspects of uh, the underlying state of the system and parameters also, which are unknown, things like theta, um, which uh, in, within theta, so things like uh, the rate of waning immunity for pertussis. Um, so to support this work, we have a set of COVID-19 particle filter models. And I'm so grateful to Xiao Yan for her work with me over all these months. Um, uh, so often both of us were working uh, very late into the, uh, the wee hours of the morning. Uh, building up a, a suite of models. It's not just one model, it's a suite. Uh, there's age specific and region, age and region specific versions. There's aggregate models, uh, subsequent models that have involved uh, some representation of vaccination, et cetera. And the models have evolved a lot uh, over the months. And we've done work with these models at all different levels from the levels of particular communities, things like Lalash Clearwater about a year ago um, uh, to estimate the effective reproductive number and ultimately the basic reproductive number there, uh, showing that it's a lot higher because of the levels of crowding um, to the kind of regional level within a province and the, and the provincial level. We've also applied them a little bit at the country level, although I won't, I won't uh, talk about that because that work was very early early on, and I, I, I don't feel I can speak about it scientific um, uh, findings. Um, so underlying all this work um, is a model. And the model captures at a certain level, I know there's people from all different backgrounds, some of which have never encountered models before. Um, this is a, a, a model, known as a type of model known as a, a compartmental or system dynamics model. And it depicts, um, kind of uh, 
the, the state of the population, uh, how many people are in different stages of, of progression with COVID-19, either in a frankly symptomatic way, that's along down that, that sort of spine of the model, or in an oligosymptomatic way, they don't really have symptoms worth um, that they think of as indicating that they're sick. Um, and according to whether they're diagnosed, that's the D subscripts here versus undiagnosed. And those flows to, from undiagnosed to diagnosed have, have great gravity. That's, you know, that's us finding people who are sick, who we might otherwise have, have missed. Um, and some of those people might have ended up, been more likely to end up in the ICU, for example, um, uh, or, or in fact have passed away because of COVID-19. So a model like this is kind of a depiction of the underlying system and the underlying state of the system. At any one time, um, there's um, for, for a normal model of this sort, there's a traditional model of this sort. There's a certain number of people it thinks are susceptible right now, a certain number that are exposed, they're infected, but not infective yet, a certain number that are pre-symptomatic state and so on. And, and you can run these models forward. Each of these flows is associated with some logic, some, some formula that, that governs the flow based on the current state of the model. So for example, this, this uh, flow right here from susceptible to, to uh, the exposed or latently infected state is characterizing how many people per day are in the underlying system getting infected. That's a flow of great gravity. Um, uh, other flows, for example, this one from IYU to, uh, to HNICU reflects people being hospitalized based on severity of symptoms who were infected um, with symptoms. Um, and, uh, you know, over time, this model will run and we'll have changing numbers of people here in the infected state with symptoms or in the susceptible state or in this recovered diagnosed state, et cetera. And some people might recover without us ever having known about them. Um, maybe they went on a, a pathway which had very few symptoms, uh, as is common for young people, for example. So this model is one that we created early on, and it's a kind of stepchild of some of the earliest modeling that I showed you uh, from this floor last week, which uh, was compartmental modeling. Um, but a model like this has been evidenced by all sorts of specific detail about how COVID-19 works. You could think of it as kind of capturing a theory about how COVID-19 works. And over time, we adjusted that theory, for example, to put in better representation of, of people without symptoms, a uh, better fraction of, of how many people are without overt symptoms, um, the fraction that die from hospital, uh, from the ICU, et cetera. And underneath all of this is a, you know, nitty gritty set of ordinary differential equations for, for whom that's a, that's comfortable language. Uh, each of these flows um, uh, is, is associated with some uh, component of um, the rate of change, contributing to the rate of change. And we can transliterate a model like this, knowing about the rules for the flows into a set of ODEs. So underneath this is ordinary differential equations, as, is, as are used by the majority of COVID-19 models out there. Um, so, so the models, though, that are the approach that we're using here is it's based on this model, but it's um, it's not of this model. It's not. Um, it doesn't consist only of, of this model, far from it. We take a model like this and we take it to an entirely different level of, of use because instead of having just one theory, instead of putting all our eggs in one basket saying, you know, I'm going to put a stake in the ground and saying there's this many people susceptible right now, this many people uh, who are latently infected, this many people who are who have a pre-symptomatic infection, instead of just betting everything on this one representation of the world, we're going to have jockeying ex different explanations for this. We're going to have 150,000 different hypotheses running at the same time, each with a different understanding of how many people are at each different stage right now. 
and each of those will run forward. But when new evidence comes in, there's going to be some accounting to do. Um, and, and that accounting will, will reward ones that are more consistent with the evidence and penalize ones that are less consistent and allow the ones that are more consistent to be fruitful and multiply whilst the others um, uh, end up being retired. Um, so uh, we're gonna have not just one version of this model running at a given time, but a whole ensemble of 150,000 of them. Um, and they're going to be competing to explain the data. And the ones that are most efficacious in explaining it will be rewarded. So what's going on here is, is a little bit more textured. There's a stochastic process. I, I didn't show you where the stochastics are in the model, but um, that model is evolving in a, in a way that's not purely deterministic. It's kind of jiggling around. Um, that means over time, you're, you're not certain exactly how it's going to move. Um, but between observations, it's going to run pretty much like a, a, each, each uh, of these competing hypotheses, which is called a particle, is going to run more or less independent, or it's going to run independently. But then when there's an observation, that's when the, the splaining has to happen. That's when there's an accounting. That's when there's, um, you know, the accounts get due. And uh, we're going to to sort of uh, adjust our understanding of what's going on collectively. Um, this is a process performed recursively. And this is incredibly important in terms of the infrastructure um, and the computational tractability. Uh, we have hundreds, hundreds, th over 400 data points these days, well, well over 400, that we're working with time points. Um, it's been more than a year, right? Um, uh, and uh, for daily time points for Saskatchewan alone. And um, if we had to reconsider all of that entire time, every time a new data point arrived, uh, it would be an incredible computational burden. Um, and so what we take advantage of is the ability within particle filtering to recursively compute. It's, it's computed in an online fashion. Each new data point comes in. We update our estimates based on the old estimate and the new data point and go forward from there, rather than having to recompute it de novo, uh, the most likely case. And um, fundamentally, um, we're running, I said, 150,000 of these in parallel. Each of them is called a particle. And it, it has, at any one time, a complete hypothesis about the state of the system. Um, and these hypotheses compete. And uh, they're each associated with a weight, which could be it, you could be excused for thinking of it as kind of representing the credibility of that, to speak uh, intuitively, the credibility of that particle's accounting. It reflects how well that particle aligned against past evidence, um, uh, you know, with, with, with some uh, qualifications. And, and what's happening is when you're, you're running this thing forward and new data comes in, um, those weights are going to be updated. And it reflects the fact that for those for whom this is a meaningful statement, this is based at its underlying level on the theory of importance sampling. And the idea is we can represent any distribution with, with another distribution um, with some limits um, if we associate weights with each sample from that other distribution. Um, and uh, here the weights represent a weight, a weight of, uh, for example, 0.5 would indicate a particle is twice as, as occurring twice as often as one that's with a weight of 0.25. And so it, it kind of represents how well um, represented that particle is. Uh, even though it's one of 150,000, it may have outsized weight if it has a weight of um, that's far above that of the other particles. And these weights are between zero and one. They're normalized. And there's a survival of the fittest, but whereby they're, they're jockeying to explain the data. And the ones that are consistent with the data are, are rewarded with bigger weights. And the ones that are less consistent with the data are, 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 um, are, are sort of uh, penalized with, with having their weights uh, be multiplied by a, a smaller value. OK, so let's talk a little bit more detail. So on um, this model here is going to be, you could think of it as having our particle filtering is having layers of this model, 150,000 layers deep. Um, 
uh, just, just all the way down. And uh, each of those has its own, at any one time, this full version of model state. Um, and uh, between observations, it just runs forward. Just it, It's a solitude. It doesn't have to care about any of the other particles. Particle weights don't change. But at the observation points, we multiply the particle weight by a likelihood, the value of a likelihood function that reflects how likely is it that given this particle's understanding or given this particle's you know, positing of what goes on in the world, how likely it is, is it that we will have observed this empirical data that's just arrived? So maybe this particle is saying, you know, I think there are tons of infectives out there and, and a, a whole lot of susceptibles. Uh, the rest are basically susceptible. Well, a particle that posits that, you know, um, is not, if, if the empirical data suggests almost nobody getting infected, you'd cast doubts on that. You'd say, well, you know, what do you mean? If there's tons of people infected out there, how come we're seeing very new few new cases coming out, um, or very few new infections. So if we have empirical data um, on, on actual infections, that would be ideal. Now, we don't have that. What we do have is cases, which are a more complex quantity having to do with diagnosis. But we can still hold up that particle's theory about the world in light of this critical evidence, give it a gimlet eye, and say, you know, how much does this square? Uh, with this. So we have a likelihood function that says, how likely is it you would see that many cases or that many hospitalizations or that many deaths or that many, you know, cases of ICU admissions in light of what this particle thinks is the number of people right now in any one of these compartments. And that likelihood gives a value and we multiply the weight by that value. Um, and uh, we end up renormalizing the weight so they sum to one. Um, now, um, there's this further process called resampling, which is the survival of the fittest. And I'm taking a, a diagram um, from uh, Xia Yan's uh, thesis uh, here, master's thesis, showing the resampling process. And basically, resampling involves um, uh, taking these weights and doing a multinomial draw from them. So things with higher numbers of weights, you get lots of representation for, and things with low weights, you have very few for. And a thing with, with twice the weight is, twice as, is, is likely to have, on average, twice as many children than one with, with half that, that weight. Um, so there's a resampling process, and, and that leads to extinction of ones which have low weight. And um, uh, the ones that have high weights are fruitful, and they multiply. Um, they're, they're consistent with the data, they're good particles, and they get rewarded by being represented. This is a stochastic model, so they won't always stay the same. They'll start to evolve in different sub-hypotheses in different ways. And it turns out this whole process, you can maintain trajectories and sample from trajectories as we do in particle MCMC. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll probably get to that as time allows. So, um, so we have these particle filter models that, that basically work according to this, uh, this recipe. Um, now, uh, yeah, a couple features of these models. So um, these models uh, early on, uh, was so much of the name of the game was reasoning about travel related cases versus endogenous cases, cases that came about within our province and, and roughly goes down into travel-related and non-travel-related cases. Um, uh, later that, you know, with, with travel restrictions and so on, uh, uh, flight restrictions that became less of an issue. This travel is uh, out of province travel, I should note. Um, now, uh, we make use of data of many sorts, and I, I mentioned that. I'll come to describing wastewater data in a little bit more, more, more detail later if, if we have time. Um, now, test data forms an incredibly important component of this, and, and I'd, I'd like to, to explain why that is in just a minute. It's a way that's little represented by models out there, but I think it's, it's absolutely central. And um, within our, our, our model, hospitalization is treated differently than it is in most models out there. Most models have traditionally treated hospitalization the numbers of people being hospitalized, going from an infected state to hospitalization as a function of the number of cases 
um, number of reported people. But that's actually not so accurate because if you're doing a lot of active case finding, if you're running drive-through centers, if you, if you open 20 drive-through centers tomorrow throughout the province, um, you're going to get a lot more cases found. I can guarantee you that. Um, but you're not going to get a lot more hospitalizations. No, the, the fraction of people that are hospitalized will actually go way down because you're going to be finding all these people who aren't very sick. Um, they got tested, but they wouldn't have come in. Whereas if you're doing very little active testing, very little act, uh, contact tracing, very little drive-throughs, very little door-to-door -door screening, you know, a lot of the people you're going to be finding are people who are really sick who, who come in. And that's a big distinction. And um, we therefore have uh, hospitalizations. The hospital flows depend on the number of people who are truly infected in the underlying system as estimated by this model. And um, finally, we have some parameter uncertainty, evolving parameters for things like contact or, or transmission rate. It's actually C beta for those who have, who have seen these sort of models before. Um, and a fraction hospitalized within a certain range, reflecting the fact that it differs over different regions or different demographics it gets into. And uh, some in, in, as far as uh, testing efficiency, et cetera. Um, Okay, so we, we have this underlying model, and this is our backbone. Um, now, from a model like this, at any one time, any one particle can be summarized in its, what it posits about the world. It's, its theory about, or its characterization about the, the current state of the system can be summarized in a vector, right? You could list end to end the number of people who are susceptible, the, for, for it, what it thinks is the number of people who are susceptible. It thinks is the number of people who are, who are, uh, ex are in, in a latent state undiagnosed or latent state diagnosed, et cetera. And this is what we call a state vector. Um, and every particle has at any one time a state vector that it's putting its stake in the ground. It thinks there's you know, that many people right now in each of these states. And that state vector would be something we we come back to when we look in a little bit more detail how this applies. Now, we are examining, I mentioned this earlier, but we are examining some, some parameters that do evolve over time. But I'd like to, to talk about how this uh, plays a role. Uh, I'll come back to this notion of a state vector a little bit later. First, I want to talk a bit about the logic of this model. So this model came about many discussions within our health system intensive reading of various literature, uh, data from um, provided to us from PHAC and, and uh, from, from reports from across the country, et cetera. Um, but there's also many elements structurally that we had to build in um, beyond data. Um, uh, for example, we needed to represent travel related cases, some of which come in diagnosed. Those are the ones that are reported, right? Three cases were found uh, coming in from the Caribbean with COVID-19. Um, this is a sort of report you might read on a provincial level last summer. Um, whereas others of them, the more pernicious ones are the ones who are undiagnosed. Those are the ones who fly under the radar, so to speak, are not found and, and therefore circulate still and, and with greater, um, uh, greater abandon and might end up uh, affecting people. So we have travel related cases. Um, but you know, those are those have been traditionally a, a rather small influence after the initial times. Um, for some smaller communities, um, they're very big. You know, for our northern communities that we simulate, they can be uh, be larger. Um, community that's smaller, that has fewer people in all the stocks, these might have a, a disproportionate contribution. Um, but if you're dealing with the province as a whole, it's, 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 it's smaller amounts uh, these days, but still something where it's really important is variance these days. Um, but I'd like to talk about the logic that drives these flows within the system, because so much of what's gone on in our province is, I mean, it's overwhelmingly dominated by endogenous factors, by the spread within the province. Uh, sure, when, it, when we had an outbreak, was partly influenced by those sparks wafting in from other provinces or out of the country, those travel arrivals. 
But what allowed that to turn into a conflagration? Now that, the fault lies not in our stars, ladies and gentlemen, but in ourselves, as a better man than I once said. Um, so here, um, uh, if we have to think about these flows, we need to grapple with this issue of testing, which is again an issue that's been brushed under the rug by most COVID-19 models out there to this day. In part, just because like with old poor Procrustes in ancient Greece, if that data wasn't available as readily, uh, the models uh, put it aside and cut off the legs that would have had helped deal with it and uh, just considered the situation without recourse to testing data. I think it's a grand mistake. Um, but testing data here is foundational. Um, often without knowing it, just like in those opening slides where I showed the New York City situation, you cannot properly interpret the patterns we see, the number of case reports, because large numbers of cases coming about suddenly can be a sign of a crisis in the making, an underlying disaster, and a spread of infection, or it could be the sign of a great success of public health that we've located a whole bunch of people um, and and you know identified them so that they can isolate properly. Um, those are two very different situations. A number of cases from some communities can be a bad sign, and others a good sign. And we saw that with the colonies, for example, and door-to-door -door screening in the north uh, early on in our outbreaks provincially. Um, by the same token, if you see very few cases, um, that's not cause for celebration. That can be a sign, who are we missing? What are we not finding out there? Um, and uh, that too has been a feature of our situation provincially at times. But cases, you know, testing in cases uh, have, have a nuanced relationship between them. There's several distinct causal pathways by which they interact. And it's reciprocal. Um, just like a lot of the models we build, we deal with these reciprocal causality, these feedbacks. So look, uh, testing can drive epidemiological cases, uh, drive epidemiological changes. The fact that we find someone removes them from circulation to a large degree, we hope, with, with, with isolation. Hard to do in the North, which is why we had community cohorting, you know, uh, uh, vehicles, you know, trailers brought in, for example, in the Lodge Clearwater, so people don't have to stay in a house filled with 10 or 15 people, but instead can stay in a in a, in a safe location away from, uh, from loved ones and avoid affecting them. But, um, but it can also lead to uh, drive, uh, you know, changes in, in perception and, and changes in behavior as a result. Test uh, epidemiology, the underlying epidemiology um, uh, being evolving can lead to changes in testing. Look, I mean, if, if a growing number of people are actually infected, there's going to be a growing number that develop serious complications, severe or critical, um, and that need either non-ICU hospital care or hospital care. And, um, and so this is reciprocal situation. And, um, and, and this is something that you know, we had to grapple with uh, a great deal. Um, so uh, we, we sought to examine these things, particularly this nuanced feature, by um, dividing up cases in our, in our uh, consideration into two cases, to two broad areas. These are areas you know, I've worked with for, for um, close to two decades now in other spheres like TB, but, but play a really big role here. Uh, we need to distinguish between passive case finding. This is passive from the standpoint of the health system, by the way. Um, the health system isn't lifting a finger, the people find it and report with symptoms. Um, they present with symptoms is kind of the term of art. And, um, and you know, here we have to give them a test to confirm that their symptoms are COVID-19. That was a big problem very early on in Wuhan, China, um, when tests were, were, uh, were in short supply and people, uh, they ended up turning to x-rays, for example. Um, uh, but, um, but fundamentally, the cases find us. Um, 
they they come and they they come in and locate the healthcare system. By contrast, there's active case finding, beating the bushes, doing mass drive-through testing, doing contact tracing, door-to-door -door screening. Here we're actually going out and we're we're finding people. And typically we, you know, we're going to test a whole bunch of people as part of that. And um, those those tests are going to if we do a lot more of those tests, we're going to find a lot more people in many cases. So I'd like to talk about each of these cases. Passive case finding, um, uh, you know, is is driven by the individual who comes in. Some of this is elective. Um, you know, someone heard that one of their friends got COVID recently at a party they were at, and so you know, this, this index person feels an obligation to go get tested. Um, or maybe they have very mild case, but they know enough about COVID-19 to know that purple color in their toes or, or that feeling a shortness of breath or chills and, and, and fever and, and a bit of a cough. That could be COVID-19. It, it, um, maybe it's not severe, but they are uh, not not critical, but they they decide to come in to get tested. Um, and elective testing is pretty variable. It depends on messaging, public awareness, risk perception, uh, stigma. Um, you know how much people perceive risk of COVID nineteen. How much they perceive risk of going and getting tested, um, because they're afraid all their friends will be noted. Uh, you know, will learn about them, and they'll be a party pooper because then everyone at the party will have to get tested, etc. Um, it, but then there are some cases that are obligatory. Those are driven by complications. They, they got to come in because they're short, short of breath and they feel like they're dying. Their lungs are on fire. Um, uh, or they have really, really bad cough that they just can't live with. These are obligatory cases. And, and there's a certain fraction of those for each person who gets infected. Um, so you know, in these cases, um, the positive test results um, are 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 driven by different things. Obligatory cases, you know, we have um, we have people. A certain fraction of those infected um, are going to, to have these obligatory symptoms. Whereas elective, it's going to be highly variable. It's going to be depending on on risk perception, etc. Um, and where these come from in the model, in both cases is the symptomatic groups. It's, it's the folks who are symptomatic. Not up here, not a, not, it's people who have symptoms. They're coming in by and large for the, for the, um, the ones who need to be tested because they're, they're, they're feeling low-key today. Um, uh, for the young people, that means they're not feeling great. Um, so uh, these, are, these are different flows re re reflecting elective presentation and obligatory um, presentation by those with COVID-19. Um, by contrast, we also have to deal with active case finding. And active case finding here um, identifies, uh, goes and beats the bushes to find people. Um, it's active from the standpoint, again, of the health system. Um, they're going and they're mobilizing and getting out the, the tests, right? Just like getting out the vote. Um, and this identifies much broader segments of individuals. It's not just those with symptoms. Uh, contact tracing might find people without symptoms. We weren't testing them originally, but you know, starting about what, July last year or something, we, we started to, to test. Um, partly, there's a drumbeat from the modeling. I, I always put in the, the, the encouragement there, and, um, and, and we realized the urgency of it, given the large fraction that were not symptomatic. Um, uh, so for active case finding, um, you know, here we're, we're, we're going out and trying to bring people in. And this is driven, the number of cases we find here are driven largely by the number of tests we get. We double the number of tests. We're going to, we're going to maybe not quite double, but we'll get a lot more people we'll find. Um, but there's a diminishing return, return thing here that, you know, uh, maybe in a, in a given regime, um, if we increase it by 10%, we'll find about 10% more people. But you know, it, there's kind of a saturation effect where we're getting the people who are willing to be tested. After all, we're, we're, we've got a more and more inclusive, you know, full subset of those, and getting each successive person is more and more difficult. It's the people who are 
who, who you know, are not very pro-social and, and people who, who are, you know, devil may care attitude and, and uh, many other, other reasons um, are working three jobs and, and don't feel they have time, et cetera. So active case finding comes from many compartments here and it's driven by tests, um, the, the number of cases you find. The more tests you do, the more cases you'll find. But if you double the number of tests, you won't get double the number of cases, okay? Um, is, is basically the, the idea. Um, and it does depend on how many people out there have, are indeed infected. So we're looking at the fraction of all infected people that are being tested. That's, that's how we judge if it's a lot of tests or a few tests. Um, Okay, now in order to, to figure out the consistent, I said that you know there's this state vector. This is vector that sort of says for each particle, it posits certain number of people in each of these compartments, certain number of people who are late stage symptomatic, certain number of people who are diagnosed, um, exposed population, et cetera. I think this is not the latest version of the model or that's, that's been actually uh, changed, but um, in order to judge how consistent it is, he uses this likelihood function. And the likelihood function basically says, look, for this particle, for its stake in the ground about how many people are in each of those states right now, how many, you know, how, how likely is it that you'd predict this data from the world? Cases, number of, of ICU admissions, hospital admissions, ICU census, hospital census, deaths, Hey, particle, given your theory about the world, how much does it jive with this evidence? Does it line up with this evidence? Um, and, and now wastewater data. And so we, this is where we give each particle a gimlet eye and say, you're, you're not measuring up. You got to do better next time. And we downweight it. Or we, we say, wow, you're really consistent. You hit this right bang on. We're going to reward you with a higher weight. Um, and so we use this likelihood function. It's a negative binomial likelihood function. It's something we've inherited from a lot of our previous work. And basically there's a dispersion parameter that reflects how wide it is or how narrow it is. And basically it's how accommodating it will be to particles that aren't bang on the mark, but are in the right general ballpark. Whether it's really, really tight in its expectations uh, this is with a certain mean or whether it has the same mean, but it's, it's very lax. It, it, it won't penalize a particle too much if it's, you know, if it's actually a thousand um, and, and it's, it's predicting, it, it would have predicted 2000. Um, by contrast here, a particles not doing well, it will penalize it with, by multiplying it by very low weight that would come out of the the, the probability um, from this uh, negative binomial distribution or Pascal distribution. Um, so we have a likelihood function and the likelihood function has to do with data of all different sorts, right? Uh, and over time, we'll be adding more data sources to this, including social media data, search data. Um, eventually we'd love to have some mobility data, et cetera. But um, here we have, Likelihood functions for all the obvious things, right? Endogenous cases, um, uh, ICU admissions, uh, non-ICU admissions, and census, et cetera. And then we have this viral concentration, which is for wastewater. Um, and if wastewater data is present for a community, we'll use it with gusto, um, more worthy than its source. Um, so here are these likelihood functions are formulated. These are negative binomial Pascal distributions. And we, um, uh, I won't go into the details of them, but, but we formulate them uh, in the appropriate way. We also have a likelihood function, which kind of weirdly has <laughs> inherited that form, but where we're hoping to really replace it soon with an alternative likelihood, um, um, likelihood model. Uh, associated with viral load concentrations. Um, this is kind of a, a bit of an eyesore for me and, and we're, we're, we're gonna probably replace it with a log normal or, or, or something along those lines. Anyway, um, so uh, at observations, we're using this likelihood function to multiply by the weight for each particle to, to you know, enhance or lower the credibility of that, of that particles accountant for the world. So those particles that poorly explored the world, explained the world, they have some explaining to do. Those that have um, a good accounting, they're rewarded. So, you know, to give an example, here's this 
here's this vector, right? This vector, the state vector for a given particle. Each particle, call it P1, P2, P3, um, has a certain stake in the ground as to how many people it thinks are going, it posits in the world or in susceptible state, exposed, uninfected state, um, or sorry, yeah, um, latent, uh, undiagnosed state, et cetera. Um, uh, and, and then we have, for each particle, we have a different view. This particle thinks this one's out to lunch and that one's out to lunch. And it thinks that virtually everyone is susceptible, right? This, this one thinks, um, well, most people are susceptible, but there's a handful down there. And this one thinks there's, that a lot of people got infected already. Um, and then we have some empirical data. Um, and the empirical uh, data is associated with, um, uh, so, so that's this data here, excuse me, um, uh, over here. So there's a certain number of actual endogenous presenting cases in a certain hospital census. But each particle has some expectations for what it would be. You know, this one thinks there should be 12 endogenous case presentations and 20, uh, the hospital census of 20. This one thinks there should be 15 of the first and two of the second. And each of those has some expectation. And then we sort of rank those, right? We, we compute the likelihood for endogenous case presentations based on what the model thinks. What's the likelihood of observing this one over here? this uh, empirical data, and we give it a rating. Um, and with this 20, what's the likelihood we would have observed that? Um, and and we, have, we have some likelihood here. So, so essentially we, um, this is not empirical data. This is, uh, this is uh, you know, sort of uh, particle expectations. Um, I actually don't need this, uh, sorry, um, expectations. Um, uh, we actually don't need to show this because this state would have a certain likelihood of explaining, uh, of, of, of seeing these, these values. And so then we compute the composite likelihood by multiplying all these and uh, we update the weights and we renormalize. I mean, that's basically what's going on. And we have 150,000 of these and we have these type of empirical data with respect to a bunch of different quantities. And you know, each of these hypotheses about the world is judged with respect to, to those pieces of data. Um, so the resampling process I spoke about earlier, I won't elaborate, except those with high weights are multiplied um, uh, with abandon and those with low weights die out. And those with medium number of weights might eke out a continued existence, but at, at smaller numbers. Um, and all the weights are renormalized to a value of one, which really Oh, I see. So um, that's after that. They're all the same size, value of one, right? Uh, and then the model, you know, this particle has gone on to live another day and, and will encounter new data. And maybe this time, this, you know, time at the bat, it will be more successful in explaining the data. Okay, so here's, that's, that's a model. What do we do with this model? Well, it, it turns out it's really, really, really super useful. Um, we can use it to kind of estimate what's the underlying situation um, at, a, at a distributional level, not put our, all our eggs in one basket and say it's this, but it's a distribution of possibilities, a joint distribution over all those different compartments. Um, we can project forward. We can ask what if questions and we can do backcasting to, to understand what was probably the case earlier. What was going on just before that snowmobile rally that infected people, um, you know, from that infected waiter? Um, and so these allow us broadly to kind of track the, the current state on, across all sorts of different outcomes, effective reproductive number, number of undiagnosed infectives, um, the force of infection, lots of others. It can also allow us to project forward where ICU demand is going where hospital demand is going, where a number of cases might be going, um, with a caveat that you've got to say something about the amount of testing you expect to do, um, because we're going to find more cases if there's more testing, uh, active case form. OK, um, so that's a, a bit about that. Let's talk about this wastewater data. Wastewater data is, is one of the newer additions to this model. Uh, and in my view, it's one of the most valuable. 
Um, uh, so, you know, a bit of, bit of schooling and sewage, if I may. Um, so um, our municipality um, um, is, is one where the sewage systems and the stormwater systems, the systems that carry water that comes down in torrential downpours in the summer from snow melts um, in the spring, um, that goes that goes and is is diverted on, on different channels, such as to the river, um, than is the water which is uh, that comes out of toilets and showers and dishwashers and laundry machines and so on in homes or in industrial processes. That latter water um, is in a different system that goes to a wastewater treatment plant. And that goes through multiple levels of, of treatment. I think it's three major levels of treatment is, is ultimately discharged as, uh, you know, following remediation as, as uh, treated wastewater. Um, and uh, within Saskatoon, the toxicology center, our partners um, do sampling of the wastewater uh, before um, it goes through most of this wastewater treatment plant. It's in the treatment plant, but um, we get it basically after it's been screened for Q-tips and toilet paper and stuff like that. And you've got this sewage flowing in at quite a clip um, and you sample from that and take a sample. And uh, the U is a royal U. It's actually a, a robot arm that grabs this stuff uh, like 12 times a day or something. And it, it puts it in a container, which is then sealed up at the end of the day and stored in a freezer. Um, so uh, it turns out wastewater data can be included in the likelihood function and really makes a difference. Um, it can make the difference between, for example, perceiving a contractionary uh, outbreak with a effective reproductive number below one, 0.95, versus one that's growing, um, or change your understanding of the number of, of, of undiagnosed infectives that are likely out there, um, uh, or the number of daily infections, or indeed the force of infection that each of us suffers when we leave our homes. Um, so uh, why is wastewater so uh, effective in this area? Well, it, it picks up people that wouldn't normally get tested, amongst other things. Um, it can pick up a much larger segment of the population. Um, and it does not have uh, privacy concerns that encumber it. Um, and uh, often it can clue you in to people in the very early stages of infection, where the viral loads that are being shedded, it is predominantly fecal shedding, uh, are much higher. And so you can catch a lot of people very early on and generally it gives something like six to seven day um, uh, whispering of what's likely to come in terms of case counts. Um, it turns out that that's kind of naive um, turning of it. Here we can use it to estimate the whole system, not just where case counts might go a few days from now, but where, where the whole system, what's, what's the whole system at? How many undiagnosed infectives are there out there, et cetera. And um, it turns out that wastewater data allows us to better match health system data. Um, so if, if you have wastewater data and you inform the model with it over time, even episodically, but it, you know, especially if you can do it three days a week or something, you, you can actually have the model much better record with health system data, um, or at least better, better record with it. Um, more than that, you can have it, its projections be enhanced. Um, so you can, you can have a greater consistency between where the model thinks things are going and where with the fullness of time, it turns out things have actually gone. So if you look at predicting over a two week time frame um, in a sort of cross validation, um, that data wasn't used up till now, it's, it's in the future still. And, and, and now we, we ask the model what it expects going forward and we collect data over the next two weeks and we compare the model and judge it. It turns out that wastewater data helps with that in predicting where health system is going. So we can predict things like ICU counts better. We can predict things not just like case counts, but ICU census or hospital census. So altogether, it's a, it's a, it allows for a more savvy model of the health system have this extra data.
And that mirrors our experience in other areas, such as flu, where we've used similar techniques to show that we can much better predict, for example, flu cases, influenza cases due to uh, H1N1 influenza, if we consider search data uh, online. Um, or in other cases, we've used social media data for opioids, for example. And, and it's to, to health scientists, it seems non-intuitive using a lower quality data source. Surely that would, um, that would you know, contaminate or, or otherwise um, uh, to, to bring in the dross would, would otherwise lessen the value of, of other sorts of data. But the point is it contains more information. Wastewater contains additional information quite orthogonal to what you get through the health system data. And it really allows us to better anticipate where the health system data is going, just as search data allowed us to better anticipate where uh, flu, uh, flu was going when combined with similar techniques. OK, now um, I'd like to talk uh, just a little bit about particle MCMC, because that takes us to an entirely different level. And uh, for this, I need to uh, provide my, um, uh, my most uh, sincere gratitude to Zhu Xin Liu for her, um, her work with me uh, over a longer period, a year or two, and really uh, fully coming to terms with this and, uh, and evolving our, our code base. Um, but basically here, we're, we're sampling from parameters together with the underlying state of the system over time. And we can reason about, for example, through sampling, what the values are that relate to the shedding population and the uh, the setting population out there that are infected with um, with uh, the, um, the the number of people uh, the wastewater concentration. Um, so particle uh, MC MC and particle filtering um, both provide a glimpse of what's going on over time, but particle MC MC provides this extra extra level of of uh, resolution to understand what fixed parameter values uh, might might be. So what does this all give us? It gives us population tomography. It kind of gives us this picture across a whole swack of different areas of the system about what might be going on right now. Not in a sense of putting all our eggs in a basket and saying, this is what's going on right now in this area, that area, that area, as a traditional compartmental model do, would do, uh, uh, be it agent-based or compartmental. But rather, this is a... Um, uh, a, a joint distribution over these things. And so we can ask, you know, um, right now, how many people are likely undiagnosed infectives out there? Or what's the likely uh, level at which people are mixing with each other? Um, uh, how many people are likely still susceptible? Um, and uh, and what's, what's sort of the, the level of uh, presentation we see among those with mild symptoms? Uh, we can also project forward, um, and I spoke about this earlier, I won't elaborate, but the point is with the underlying model, we have kind of the theory about how COVID-19 works. And if we put in an assumption about how much active case finding we're going to be doing in the next bunch of days, we can look forward and anticipate where the system might be going. We can, we can recognize its momentum and, and just project that momentum forward according not in a curve fitting way but according to the to the to the logic of covid-19 how it's transmitted how it progresses uh, the fraction of people that go in for hospitalizations etc and critically for our health system we can project forward not just cases or or new infections we can project forward also things like non icu hospitalizations or icu hospitalizations icu census to give some sense about where um, hospital demand might be two weeks from now um, and what fraction of our ICU beds might be occupied. This is of, of great interest and there's no way you're gonna get that directly out of curve fitting for cases, for example. You can also do back casting to understand what was likely the case earlier in light of not just the data till that point, but later data. Um, and you can ask what if questions. And we've done some of that with this model, although our main tool is the agent-based model that of which I, I gave a glimpse last time and on which I'll be speaking um, with you uh, in a few weeks uh, hence. Um, 
Okay, I want to talk about infrastructure because uh, whilst uh, we're further along time-wise than uh, I was planning to take, um, for us as computer scientists, this will probably be of, of interest. Um, all of this work would have had very little of the impact it did if it weren't for the efforts of Lugier uh, early on, um, with some help from Jason Gerritsen, and also with um, uh, later work by uh, Eric uh, Tartarash, um, uh, sorry, Eric Tartarash, sorry, I, I, it was a portmanteau, um, Aaron Tartarash, uh, Eric Redekop, and um, Mpion Patel, particularly, um, who, are, who were contributing to the infrastructure buildup. <laughs> Basically, the use of the infrastructure reflects the fact that at this time last year, eh, a bit later, maybe June, um, June, July, I was spending hours a day just writing reports, just coming up with reports, running the model on my personal machines. This room was a hub of operations with several machines going and, um, and running our scripts on the results to, to create requisite charts, writing up emails, sending them out. Um, hours and hours a day. Um, and, you know, I was uh, not desirous of spending my time on those issues where we had much more pressing issues on, on model evolution to address. Um, and, and, you know, a set of other priorities. So um, we recognize that there's this pipeline, a logical pipeline of, you know, data ingestion and pre-processing scripts and cross checks on the data. Um, uh, launching the run, the model on different uh, machines, preparing it each day for those machines, uh, scripting to generate things, uh, to generate reports, um, you know, putting together emails. Um, this is a, a pipeline, and we could automate pipelines. And um, you know, probably about this time last year, I gave Lucha the um, the charge, laid down the challenge. Um, um, and, and, you know, I said, look, given this ecosystem we've built up of clients and needs for reporting and different models and different data sources, and, um, you know, can we put together a system that would help us run this and run it in a distributed fashion? Uh, so amazingly, Lugia um, put, put his back into the effort and created a system of the sort that you see schematically diagrammed there, where these days, you know, we're consuming data um, uh, from multiple uh, points of uh, availability. And I, I actually haven't updated the, even this with FNIB data um, and uh, putting it into repositories of, of, of data and uh, going through scripting, feeding them into models, running models and producing reports. Um, now, this is no mean sort of bailing wire and beeswax held together system. It's, it's a system which is done in a fashion that's at once um, beautiful and offers tremendous utility, scalability, and uh, a great deal of, of extensibility um, as, as befits something of, of, uh, of beauty and elegance as well. Um, so it allows for this declarative specification of multiple aspects of the configuration. Um, we, can, we can sort of state what we want for different components, whether it's the machines we want to run it on, the scripts that should be run, uh, the particulars of the, the model parameterization, the date, et cetera. Um, it has consistency checking to a degree for input files making sure that it's, it, there's nothing crazy looking in it. Um, we have uh, a whole lot of files output to facilitate debugging or, or problem uh, investigation. And uh, perhaps most significantly, um, in late night sessions, we, we developed taxonomies of scenario types that really helped us kind of make explicit previously tacit concepts that lots of modelers carry around, but, um, but which had previously been merely implicit in our work. So um, as part of this, we have to configure the whole system. And there's all these different elements that you wouldn't anticipate up front. Some of them, for example, the data taint window size reflected learnings that went on this process. 
uh, early on, I thought of the data coming in as, as streamed data, where each new data point is accreted atop a time series formed by the previous ones. And then I found, as in so many areas of, of uh, practical life in the health system, uh, it just ain't so simple. And one of the uh, the learnings there is that each when each new day's data comes in, often it comes with a raft of changes to recent day's data. So they may go back two weeks and modify data, even as they deliver a new data point. So it's not just the new data point, it's revisions to old data points. We have to take that into account and you know, recognize the fact we're running different scenarios and we have different reports that have to be generated for different clients and different ensemble sizes for the number of particles um, uh, we have different input data that's required different emails for different people, even with a given client who gets certain types of reports, et cetera. Um, one of the most important components was this scenario taxonomy. Um, because I'm, I'm running late here, I'm, I'm not going to go into it details, but basically it distinguished between three types of scenarios and um, supported at an operation level a compositionality between them that allows you to, for example, uh, start with a full empirical span simulation, successively extend it with an, an incremental simulation, one after the next, and then run projection runs, which are kind of dead end runs atop of those uh, in a way that captures nice handoffs uh, in the requisite data and allows it to, to modularly be extended. Um, and we have different types of execution configurations for these. And each day these are run, whether it's projection runs or incremental runs. And often we have some full empirical span running runs going. I'm not gonna expand on that, but it was a, a big component, a big step forward. And it was fundamentally enabling in terms of the computations because um, there was a time where from this very seat, I was able to rerun the particle filter with all the models data um, uh, overnight or within a day's time. Um, and that time crept up from 16 hours to 17 hours to 18 hours uh, in, in a most um, uh, a most difficult of fashions. Uh, the strictures of the computational resources were closing in upon me. And uh, Xiao Yan working with Lu Jie um, freed me from these shackles um, by providing this uh, infrastructure to support incremental runs where you know, each new day, we just have to take account a new data point and the tainted data from the past few weeks and we can run it forward and run it forward. And uh, that took advantage of the recursive character of particle filtering as well as um, uh, the, the computational infrastructure. We have a lot of work going on in this. A tremendous amount of use by uh, Jeremy Young on um, GPU-based acceleration using the, the formative um, elements put in place by Lugier. Um, we, uh, we have uh, a lot of work going on in PMCMC um, more generally um, in investigation of it that has really advanced our understanding of not only of how to apply it methodologically most uh, to greatest effect, but also of the uh, some of the factors related to wastewater. Um, uh, and um, we're seeking to expand the work additionally to, to cover additional things like um, uh, some particle filtering for ABMs and uh, effectively assessing the blind spots of these models. Um, lessons learned. Well, um, uh, you know, this work would have offered a small fraction of its value if we didn't have a service provision behind it. Really what's the, the value being delivered comes some from the models, but it comes from especially from production of results from those models, regrounded by actual data every single day. Um, that's what really offers uh, the, the most value here. Um, it's not the models, it's the modeling and the constant updating of that modeling with empirical evidence. The model can be off base, it can, it can have problems, but if it's being corrected daily, now that's something by which it can be much more effective. And you know, there's huge demand for daily reporting and projection. Uh, I saw it, it's insatiable um, face reared upon me in early last summer 
and we've risen to the occasion with Lu Jie's work together with, with Xiao Yan's and, and others. Um, uh, there was a lot of education needed here um, on dynamic thinking and on reasoning about the underlying system rather than treating cases as the kind of the, the gold standard of, of what's happening in the world, which was all too often the case. In this sphere, many of our uh, partners, uh, you know, viewed the case data as the truth, whereas in truth it's lagged and it's incomplete uh, and it's biased, particularly by age, in ways that really hide the underlying situation. Um, and we really need to bring people along with the need to reason about this underlying situation. This infrastructure was absolutely essential for us to deliver value. And I don't believe there's anything like it in the world. I believe the system that we've built here for this work is, if not the single most sophisticated system in the world, there might be a handful of others. But I, um, I'm not even sure of that. I think it, it may be actually most sophisticated in its repertoire. Um, there's a lot of lessons I've learned about reporting these things daily. Um, uh, the knots people can get tied in, um, uh, you know, through uh, sending out a report too early um, or not explaining uh, why a big change in results that have, have helped shape my learning for future priorities. Um, and, um, and, you know, this is something where uh, we we have a lot of work to do still to realize its full potential, there's tremendous opportunities going forward, but already it's delivering such manifest value that um, I think it's going to have a lot of extra demand built up uh, over the next, uh, next few years for something like this. Um, there's a lot of technical lessons learned that uh, I'm gonna minimize here. Um, suffice it to say that we've very, seen, uh, very clearly seen evidence that we really need very large particle counts um, to, um, to reliably use the system, get reliable results day to day. We need big, big iron to support that, not in a mainframe sense, but in the sense of machines with lots of memory. Um, uh, entering into this work, I thought I was doing pretty well with a machine with 32 gigs. Um, these days, we prefer to run on machines with over 300 gigs. Um, and uh, we, uh, we, we need the space to, to store that. Um, incremental processing, which wasn't there at the beginning, has been essential. Um, and uh, we have done a tremendous amount of model tuning, uh, both Xia Yan and I, over the months to really get these models to perform uh, most adequately. Um, you know, really what we're hoping to add to this system is... Um, a set of extensions. I'm going to go light here, but one I just want to highlight. This is something Jenny Basran, who really co-led this work from a health system clinical perspective, um, uh, emphasized from the start and on an ongoing basis. Um, we, we got partway through, but uh, weren't able to uh, finalize that, unfortunately. And that is uh, a collaborative, interactive visualization of these results. We send out PDFs right now and email reports. They are a pale cipher to what you can learn if you have an interactive interface to, um, to drill down, to comment on things, share them with others, um, you know, refer back to yesterday's results, refer to the results from another jurisdiction, and flexibly manipulate them. And, and of all the gaps um, that are most glaring in the system, this is the one I feel most keenly day to day. Um, and it's, some, it's something which is so possible, so near yet so far. Okay, so some conclusions. Um, having penalized you like low performing particles uh, with, uh, with too much verbiage, um, uh, I'll, I'll just make some, some uh, concluding remarks. So um, models gain enormous additional value if used for service provision with ongoing updates. This lesson is actually not reserved just for these models. It's also been felt uh, very strongly in the ABM side, where we're on a continuous basis updating the ABM, um, the provincial-wide high-resolution high intervention-focused ABM. But there, it's more—it's a manual process. Here, it's been automated 
through heroes like Ludier um, and uh, those supporting uh, him in, in later infrastructure uh, work. These infrastructures are not niceties. They are fundamental enablers for this sort of service delivery. Um, they can be absolute game changers, including spotting data quality issues and quickly turning around results. Um, and yet the methods we use, these computational statistical methods of particle filtering, particle CMC, are really well suited, uh, both in their computational uh, trade-offs and in terms of their generality for models and distributionally to work with many public health data streams um, in many types of models. Um, that can really take many models, not just this one, but, but many other um, models out there and use them for service delivery. Um, uh, and this has shown its, its strengths at the local level, regional level, and national level. It's not a turn the crank process. There was a lot of tuning I did in this very room, um, uh, not nine months thence. And um, uh, the, the approaches we're using, the particle filtering and particle MCMC support a rich ability to bring together different time series, wastewater, social media, search data, you name it, um, with traditional health system data to really shed light on what's really going on there, to hear the collective whispers, to give us this sort of 3D picture in this, you know, this uh, particle filter tomography of the underlying um, system um, that, that, that underlies these different faces we see day to day in the reported data. Um, and the reporting pipelines can allow for really efficient and scalable data ingestion and reporting and, and potentially interactive exploration to inform decision making. Um, it does require heavy lifting computationally. And this is why we use GPUs to accelerate it these days and distributed computing from the very get go has been a key part of Luce's, um, uh, Luce's mandate to, to take advantage of that. Um, but it offers great values. And, and, and now I'll close again with a reminder of the heroes here. Um, these are heroes who, um, with Xiaoyan and, and Lu Jie's, uh, uh on their part, you know, they took a real right angle turn from their thesis work and graduation plans to serve our province and serve our country. And um, that was a matter of great sacrifice. And it was a matter, I hope you'll agree, a great success in terms of not just uh, the engineering of the system, not just the methodology, the science of the methodology of the system, building things of like of which the, the world had not seen before, but also in delivering value at a time of crisis uh, for our for our country and for our uh, for our province. Um, I do also want to thank uh, Jeremy. And Aaron, Eric, Biom, um, and uh, Ben, uh, also in the fall, um, contributed a great deal. I mean, they were the glue that held this system together since September, day in, day out, reporting to all our different clients, all our different scenarios, dealing with data changes, you know, really putting in all the extra effort not only to get those reports out on time, but to answer questions, deal with inconsistencies in the data, put in place those extra checks that would require conscientious um, um, moments to, to deal with data inconsistencies and really taking ownership of it like few undergrads have ever seen. So, um, uh, but I wanna highlight uh, Xiaoyan and Lu Jie's work and, um, Jayad's family uh, and uh, for, for their uh, bearing with this situation. So um, thank you so much to them, um, Jushin Liu, for our foundational uh, work on, on this and work I'm, I'm looking forward to continuing under the, uh, the NSERC, um, uh, NSERC and PHAC um, uh, sponsored uh, Mathematics and Public Health for Public Health Grant. Um, uh, for postdoc Jeremy and uh, the Health Authority and Ministry of Health for really providing the groundwork for, for building this infrastructure um, and, and PHAC for a wastewater contract um, that built allowed us to really um, build that into our production system. Uh, PHAC and FNIB for, for reporting contracts um, 
that are in place, uh, collaborators um, also at the Toxicology Center and uh, key people who have inspired this work. So thank you very much. I'll, I'll stop my comments there having run over and I'd be glad to answer questions here, bearing on the mind that um, I will have a uh, meeting with Australian collaborators in another 10 or so minutes. So glad to, uh, to make some, um, make some remarks if people are interested in asking questions. I see if there's something in the chat. Maybe there's a, um, oh, thanks. Um, uh, so I uh, appreciate the, um, the, the feedback in the chat privately. Uh, it's very, very kind. Um, but anyone want to speak up, ask any questions or, or um, you know, uh, advance, uh, advance suggestions? Put something in the chat if you'd like to ask there. Hi, Nate. Uh, would you mind if I ask a quick question? Just sure. Out of sure, sure. curiosity. Uh, so you mentioned the uh, recursive, this online fashion, uh, you know, uh, re-estimate the, getting the estimation by using the new data. Yeah. I would just want to, uh, because you mentioned some online fashion, uh, you mentioned you use the uh, previous estimates. So yeah. yeah, I just wonder what, what are they referring to uh, specifically? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, um, um, you could probably correct school me on the the appropriate uh, language to use in, in this sphere because it's it's something that um, you um, you're very familiar. No, 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 not at all. I was just curious because so, it's definitely a clever idea. You know, you don't have to rerun the model from you know from yeah. the uh, very beginning, right? It's very time consuming, as you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's right. It's 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 a simple idea. I mean, I, I, and. Um, it, it takes advantage of really two things. Um, one of them is is kind of a a computational hack, um, uh, and the other is a um, uh, is 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 the basic uh, statistical structure of of particle filtering. Um, the the latter of which is is very familiar to you with the the so called condensation algorithm, which you know both you and I are are eager to try to move beyond, right? Where we we just take the the, the proposal distribution um, being uh, induced by just running the model forward with, with nothing more sophisticated than that. Running it forward from the last observation, we get out a distribution and we use that as the proposal distribution. And that allows us um, in terms of the probabilistic formulation to simply take the new likelihood for the new observation and multiply it by the old weight to get the new weight. Um, uh, and you and I have discussed how there might be prospects for, for moving to a more sophisticated um, uh, you know, framework, which would require fewer particles. Um, it would have a better proposal distribution. Um, and I'm, I'm keen to you know, work with you on that. But that's one feature of the situation. I mean, like if we have the old weight and we have, can we get this new data in and we can combine it in um, with, with uh, to computer likelihood and multiplied by the old weight, then we're, you know, we get we get the new weight, which is what the particle filtering algorithm requires. But um, but then there's a computational hack. I, I said, I mean, 
you know, it's 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 hugely enabling, but it's it's completely boring from the standpoint of math and stats, probably. Which is, um, you know, we're running these things with a given model might be running with 150 gigs used. I mean, it, it, like these are serious consu consumers of memory, and we can't afford to have all of our model runs running, you know, in perpetuity till the next time point come in, then go forward wait another day, go forward and occupy all that memory. So so basic deal is we serialize the, the model state, including the, you know, when I say model state, I mean also like the, the values of all the particle, the, the weights of all the particles and so on. We, we when we run forward, we get the latest data, we incorporate it, we, um, we, we have, have done all the weight updates. Then we just output all that information and the model can close. Um, and that allows that machine to be reused, but it, it's, it's all serialized away. So the next day, it's all freeze dried up. And so the next day when new data arrives, we just rehydrate it when and it you know sucks in all the data it exported the previous day. And uh, now it's like the model's back in operation saying, where's my new data? And, and we feed it the new data. Um, and 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 it goes forward from there. So there's there's a need to kind of um, stop the model um, when the when all its work has been done for a day and free up that memory for other processes that involves an intensive sort of uh, outputting of the complete state of the model. And and we do that in addition to outputting sampled state for every time point, uh, which which is also important. Um, and, and it's that exporting that allows this to be run incrementally together with this, you know, the, the, the recursive structure of, of the particle filtering algorithm. The fact that my weight update now is, is some, you know, value that, in, that uh, some function of the old weight for this particle and, and the likelihood function. Um, there, there's there's some recursive formulation there that doesn't mean I, I have to go back over all data. PMCMC, by contrast, as you know, for each MCMC iteration, you have to you know do a full particle filtering, and so um, that that's uh, that is something that requires all the data from start to finish to be considered. Yeah, hope that's helpful. Thank you, thank you very much, Nate. I noticed there's another question in the chat window. So yeah, great. Um, uh, do the technical details for the modeling extend beyond any logic in Java? Uh, well, uh, that's a good question. Um, there's lots of other details. Um, I, I'm, I'm trying to think about how to fully address this. So there's tons of other um, components in a way, which are captured in things like data cleaning scripts um, to kind of do data processing and data consistency scripts. The, these are more about the data than the model structure. Um, there's also files that for configuration that specify what values to use for certain model parameters uh, outside of any logic. So we have a whole infrastructure set up, which I don't know how Lugia did this, but um, you know, he, he has this whole infrastructure with Python and shell scripting and remote systems as well as local systems, multi-tier system with, with distributed computing. And, and, you know, he overrides certain values of parameters within the AnyLogic model based on things computed outside of it. And part of the idea was, Jeff, to, to make it really easy when new data comes in for a given day, we shouldn't have to go back and from the AnyLogic model. Like, I don't, want, I don't want to get involved in the AnyLogic model day to day to, to get involved. I just want to make it declarative. Like, give me my new run for today's data. And the idea is it should be able to go off. And the reality fell a little bit short of that just because of uh, mumble things. Um, there, there's some details about how AnyLogic does things that are kind of a pain sometimes. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with this. Um, and uh, that kind of was a thorn in our side that meant we, we still had to do some amount of, of work, uh, but it's much improved, much improved. So, um, 
So that, that stuff is stored outside the AnyLogic model. Lots of things like what scripts to run for which clients, what emails to send things to for which clients, what are the parameters for the scripts? Um, you know, all those sort of things are outside of AnyLogic, outside of Java. They're all declarative. We have all these configuration files, which are, uh, which are uh, quite, quite something to look at and which are declarative. Um, it's not code. It's just like it says, let it be this way. And um, it's beautiful. Um, and it's beautiful because of Routier's efforts. And then the am amazing amounts of simplification that have uh, an ease of, of, of use that have been enabled through Aaron Redekop, Aaron Redekop, <laughs> Aaron Todorash and Eric Redekop um, with, with help by uh, Diom um, and with, with Routier's continued involvement. Yeah. So, so that's all outside of any logic. We are seeking to, to um, make this approach broader in its scope than any logic. Um, we have all these PMCMC models. We'd love to get running of this. We have a code base for particle filtering that is many times faster than the any logic code base and uses a fraction of its memory that we'd love to get running with GPUs. Um, so we have things that can make this thing you know, a lot, fa tons faster. And we, we, we need to, to uh, broaden the support of the system for non any logic uh, model encodings. And that's a summer task um, that I would, to which I would like to apply myself and my, my team's efforts. Yeah, hope that's helpful. <clears throat> I'm overdue down under, but I'm, I'm glad to, um, Glad to answer if there's one or more, uh, one or two more questions here. Ladies and gentlemen, it's always an honor to uh, enjoy the enjoy your attention for this long, I recognize that this talk has tested um, uh, the both uh, attention and um, patience and um, and likely you know the scope of your interests. But hope hope that it's given a glimpse of a call to service offered by our group in response to a dire need. Uh, in the pandemic. Next time, we'll be seeing um, how that applied in kind of a parallel way for agent-based modeling and how the two are not solitudes from each other, how there's some opportunities for cross-learning between the model forms. There's some parallel lines of needs that emerged. Um, and uh, we'll be examining that um, from this seat, from this floor um, in, uh, several weeks hence. So uh, in the meantime, uh, thank you so much for your uh, kind, uh, kind attention. I'm looking forward to uh, advancing the system more, but most of all for celebrating the sacrifices and the successes uh, and the heroism of our fellow students here, um, particularly uh, those I've, I've listed as part of this talk. So thank you very much to them. Thank you very much to you. Stay safe. And uh, I look forward to joining you in a few weeks with, with some glimpses of a different world with uh, agent-based modeling. Thanks so much. Take care of that.